I always think of Malcolm Frager as a highly intelligent, very serious, had the best of liberal arts educations as well as the best piano education. He was the only authentic genius I personally knew. He was just one of the most likable men I've ever met. He was a, a very warm and humane individual and, and his, uh, his great humanity was reflected in his music. And I think he was a, a great pianist and, and um, not as appreciated as he should have been. Malcolm Frager, American Pianist, is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the Vote of the People of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The Friends and Family of Dr. Robert Jabora. The Eastman School of Music, Rochester, New York. And by the members of Prairie Public. That he was unbelievably well equipped for the instrument is beyond any discussion. He had wonderful hands, wonderful sound, and he could play just about anything and everything written for the piano. My grandmother was playing something at the piano and my brother is two years old, she stops and he plays it. Something musical was going on long before anybody else knew it. Someone who did understand young Malcolm was his Aunt Evelyn Rubenstein, Malcolm's first piano teacher. My mother was just warmth personified, you know, she, she just exuded love and, and she loved her students and, you know, she loved Malcolm. They would get together and play music to piano music and she would play the orchestral part and concertos that he was working on. He was our class prodigy. Everybody knew Malcolm was special, really special. Once I had heard Malcolm play, I knew he was special. Just wasn't like any of my friends who were playing a piano. Malcolm and I encountered each other on the sidelines, and, um, and we started talking, and Malcolm explained to me how he, was, he could not participate in any kind of contact sports where it might hurt his hand. And he was so intent. Uh, I would never have disturbed him while he was practicing. He never bragged about himself or promoted himself amongst his peers. That, that wasn't his style. Very centered in, his, in himself. He would, I didn't find him insecure, which usually shy people are. He described himself as being painfully shy. He was, you know, occasionally subjected to teasing and People didn't understand, you know, the implications of being a classical musician. At this time, more than ever, I was making plans for the future. I imagined myself as a great pianist touring all over the world. Paris, Vienna, Berlin, and many other places. And if I were to succeed in these future dreams, I must work diligently now. In 1948, the 13-year-old Frager traveled to Kansas City to participate in master classes under celebrated pianist and teacher Carl Friedberg, keeping detailed journals. Then, Malcolm traveled with Friedberg to New York to continue his studies. The summer that I met Malcolm Frager was 1956, which was a summer in which I decided that I was not going to be a pianist, that even practicing at 10 or 12 hours a day was not going to put me in the league with Malcolm Frager. I was one of the dozen or so pianists. Malcolm Frager was one of them. So was Anton Querdy and Gilbert Kalish, Van Cliburn, James Levine at the age of 10 or 11, all absolutely first-rate pianists. You won't find more than two or three who are both interested in performance at a very high level and the scholarship that stands behind that performance, and Malcolm was one of those. Although his family was originally Jewish, Frager was raised in the faith of Christian science. 
As a young girl, Sadie Friedman, Frager's maternal grandmother, had become seriously ill and hope for her recovery was all but lost. She rallied unexpectedly following the intervention of a Christian science practitioner, rendering her a devout Christian scientist for the remainder of her life. She raised her daughters, Florence and Evelyn, in that faith. Frager was as disciplined in his faith as he was in his music making. The first time I saw a boyish look on his face as a, as a grown man, we were in Stockbridge, and it was the Christian Science Church. At the time, he was the first reader, and my parents were visiting, and he didn't tell them he was going to be doing the sermon. And he gets up there, and he's just beaming like a little boy because he knows his mom's going to be proud of him. Whenever he traveled, even on tour, faith had been a priority. He was in Rochester for a visiting committee meeting, and I said, well, we're going to have a special um, rehearsal of some kind with the Cleveland Quartet on Wednesday night that I'd love you to attend. And he said, no, I can't. I've got to go to the testimonial meeting. And that led to a discussion of Murray Baker Eddy and Christian Science and how important that was to his life. In the decade of the 60s, Frager was in demand. Concerts were his for the asking, and his childhood dream was becoming a reality. New York had been good to him, and he was about to meet the love of his life. I came on a traveling scholarship, and uh, I was probably 22 or so, 21, 22, and I actually met Malcolm uh, on that first trip. I was introduced to him by friends, and then I watched him walking up Fifth Avenue, conducting a score with his hand, walking up Fifth Avenue, and I remember thinking, what an odd person. <laughs> I emigrated uh, within a year to New York, and just as sort of luck or fortune would have it, I met Malcolm that very afternoon that I landed in New York City. I was looking for a job. My father's in town. He has a lot of contacts, a lot of business contacts. And um, give me your phone number, and I'll ask him, and I'll let you know, you know, if there's anything that can come of it. Nothing came, you know, of the job, but he had my phone number. We were married two years later. He had a concert that day. That was the pattern of my life well established from the very beginning. I could always tell when he was happy with a performance, just by, you know, the sparkle in his eye afterwards, his readiness to talk with people and to go out afterwards with friends. He came to Boston and played also at Esplanade and I went to the concert. Esplanade is not a terribly distinguished gig, even for somebody in his early 20s, uh, but it's the Boston Pops Esplanade Orchestra playing and Malcolm knew that I was there and the next day called me at home to ask me how I really thought he had played. I had gone backstage afterwards and said that I thought he played wonderfully, but now he wanted to know how I really thought he played and I told him I would not have said that he played wonderfully had I not believed that. And it must have taken me five minutes on the phone to convince him that I meant that. I was impressed by that because I thought a guy with his prowess at the piano didn't need to be encouraged by the likes of me, but apparently I was wrong. In 1963, Mr. Frager, having established himself as an artist of international stature by winning back-to-back -back in the 59-60 season, both the Leventritt competition and uh, the uh, Queen Elizabeth of Belgium competition, was invited to undertake a tour on Soviet territory, and uh, that was also the beginning of his professional collaboration with Vladimir Ashkenazi. I remember he came backstage, and that's how we met in Carnegie Hall. I was 58. I remember a very pleasant appearance, very shy, and he looked uh, very intelligent. So often I heard him speak Russian, it was quite incredible, because when he came to the Soviet Union, Everybody was amazed how well he spoke the language. Unbelievable. He told me that, you know, he got kicked out of the Soviet Union because he spoke Russian. I said, well, why would they do that? They, he said, they actually thought I was a CIA spy. I said, were you? He said, I'm not telling you. 
That's on a need to know basis, he said. <laughs> so we had three concerts in Moscow. And between the concerts, we recorded uh, an LP um, with the Schumann and the Bartok Sonata. I listened to this recording of Ashkenazi and Frege just hundreds and hundreds of times. Frege was, from very early on, one of my idols. And I listened to that, and it was so fantastic. And we enjoyed that very much. And Malcolm played really like, like a Russian playing the Russian bells. So it was great fun. It's impossible to describe listening to him play in a concert, in Carnegie Hall or anywhere else. It was, it, you just cannot describe the, the emotion. Words can't do it. Only music can do it. Yes, he had a lot of talent playing the piano, but he also worked at it very hard, and he was very dedicated to it and very disciplined about practicing and studying and learning and always learning more and reading about different composers. His name, Frager, if you pronounce that in German, then you have Malcolm Frager, and Frager means the one who asks questions. <laughs> so that's very typical, Malcolm Frager. He just wanted to know an answer to everything. And he was not the kind of person who, who settled with questions. He wanted answers. Whatever he learned, whatever crumb he learned from a manuscript or a musicologist or someone who had discovered an idea, uh, he used. And so he was constantly learning and teaching what he learned. Malcolm had a phenomenal influence on me. Just before he had started uh, teaching me, um, I had been to a number of master classes and um, I had felt like um, like putty in the hands of these teachers, you know, they try to squeeze you into shape according to their musical ideas and Malcolm was completely different. He encouraged me to be myself um, and he, he taught me to bring out what is special in me and he also taught me to be my own teacher. There was once an article, and the headline of the article described him, Malcolm Frager, musician, um, neighbor, I think traveler, scholar. And he got very upset at that word scholar being in there. He didn't want to be identified as a scholar. He wanted to be the performer. He always wanted to know what the composer had written and to get the essence of that. But he also always wanted a performance to be spontaneous. One thing that he used to say was that he loved to play the piano to make it seem for the audience and maybe for himself somewhat that it was the first time that they had ever heard the piece. I think his intellect and his research informed his interpretation to a certain extent. But it, for him, they always had to be at the service of the affections and the feelings and the heart. And he often spoke of this, trying to understand what it was the composer felt at the moment of composition. He was always wanted to find first editions that were published in the lifetime of the composer. He had a number of first editions of pieces. For instance, uh, the Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto, he had a first edition of that which was totally different than the second version of it. To see the handwriting of the composer, it opened up for him an understanding of their character, 
you know, how Mozart wrote everything down almost perfectly from the start, and Beethoven wrote, scored things out and tried over and over again. He did the greatest service to music by discovering and by making it possible for the world to find out about this cache of manuscripts hidden in Poland. I recall many different conversations about the manuscripts which were lost after the Second World War. They had been taken out of Berlin when the aerial bombardments began for safekeeping and as the, the Nazis were more afraid of the Soviets than they were of the Western Allies, they stored most of these manuscripts in the eastern part of Germany, in Silesia, in territory that became, after the Yalta Accords, part of Poland. And after the war ended, uh, apparently uh, trucks from the Polish army made the rounds to some of these castles, and in particular to the cloister church of Grisau in Silesia, and rounded up these uh, wooden crates branded with PSB, and they drove off into the horizon, and after that there was no trace of these things. It wasn't really clear what was going on, but there was denial all around, and gradually as these things happened, rumors began to circulate that these manuscripts uh, might be in Krakow. Malcolm had a tour of Poland one year. We were having dinner with a Polish professor, a musicologist, and his wife in Poznan, I believe. And um, when Malcolm raised the subject, he was very interested and said, you know, let me go and make a phone call. And he did this and then came back into the room and Malcolm, who wrote about this experience of uh, the manuscripts, said he came back with an ashen face. And he said, this is a state secret. Nobody's supposed to know about it. Malcolm later had the opportunity of meeting Madame Lisa after he introduced the subject. She said, yes, the manuscripts were in safekeeping at the Jagiellonian University. She looked at Malcolm and she said, you know, I like your face. I can trust you. And she opened her drawer and gave him a list of all the manuscripts that were in the possession now of the Polish government. Shortly after that, he went to the library and asked the librarian if he could see the manuscripts. The man said, well, I can't imagine how uh, if they knew about it in Warsaw, we wouldn't know about it here because you're talking about it's being here, but all right, if you're insistent, uh, come back tomorrow and I'll let you know. And he went to the librarian the next morning and said, I have an idea. Perhaps I could give you the questions. Your assistant could look at the uh, manuscript and give me the answers. And the man said, all right, all right, so give me the list, all right, I'll, I'll come back tomorrow. And Malcolm came back the next day. And when he came in, the man turned around and he pulled open a drawer and took out the manuscript and handed it to Malcolm. He said he just wept. It was an extraordinary experience for him. When he had regained his composure and wiped his eyes, he put on the white gloves and looked at the manuscript. He stared at every note, at every rest. He thought this might be the only opportunity in his entire life to see this thing. Might I look at something else? because he knew that there were all these other treasures. And he told his assistant, let Mr. Frager, you know, go up to the stacks and see anything he wants to there. And at the end of the day, he decided to go for the jackpot. He said, is it possible to get a microfilm or a photocopy of any of these things? I said, what would you like? When they sent these things to him, he gave them to the Mozarteum. One of the most spectacular moments in the history of the Foundation. And that's one of the reasons why Malcolm was a guest of honor whenever he was in Salzburg for these 
irreplaceable services that no one else but he could have rendered to world culture. I know he loved to be at home. He loved the feeling of peace that he got at home um, in the Berkshires. It's the reason that he and my mom decided to move out of New York City. Uh, he spent so much time in cities and in hotels, and so he just loved to have a, an oasis that was his home. Foothill Farm transformed him as much as he transformed Foothill Farm, I think. I remember calling home from New York City once and asking to speak to Malcolm and being told, oh, I'm sorry, he's out in the orchard pruning the trees. He had a wonderful studio. We bought it because we could make the barn of the farm into his studio so that he could, I mean, he used to say he was going to the office. <laughs> and he could separate himself from the family and really work and not interrupt the family. We didn't have to be quiet all the time for him. He had two beautiful pianos up there um, that he played on, and my brother and I would go over there quite often and lay on this shaggy rug that he had on the floor um, listening to him practice. I loved to just go into his studio and lie under the piano and, and listen, or lie on some of the pillows in his studio and, and listen to him practice. He would play um, Liszt's Hungarian Rhapsody. The Rhapsody number no. eight begins with a slow introduction, quite sad and melancholy. And later on, it turns into a dance, at first rather graceful and capricious, later becoming more and more boisterous until finally everyone joins in, stamping his feet and clapping his hands. My brother and I, with our moppy hair, would just dance around like maniacs around his piano and he just would laugh. Whenever he played the Hungarian Rhapsody number no. eight, he would always start it off saying by special request and that special request was always my sister and, and my request. The Frager Collection arrived at the Sibley Music Library in 1992. It was the gift of Mrs. Morag Frager, uh, one year after Mr. Frager passed away. The Malcolm Frager collection is the second largest uh, collection that the library holds. As a concert pianist, of course, uh, his career was on all continents, and one sees that readily from the sweep represented in the documents. The concert programs uh, beginning in the 1950s, his earliest years of performing, extending through uh, to the last season that he was living. Frager's final performances were in Baltimore in July of 1990 with longtime collaborator and friend David Zinman. It wasn't, there wasn't any kind of closure with Malcolm. The last time I talked to him on the phone, I could hardly recognize his voice. No one, no one told me he was sick. I phoned him a few times, he phoned me, and I said, you're not playing, what's happening? He said, well, I, I'm tired. He never said he was sick or ill, let alone mortally ill. Well, I had a very strange and creepy experience there was music playing and I was shaving. And suddenly I turned around and Malcolm was standing there. Just that, and I kind of looked away and I looked back, he was gone. And then I went into the other room to look and the radio said, Malcolm Frager mit der Kontradanz von Chopin. And then I realized that Somehow my mind had made this connection because Malcolm always played that piece as an encore. And I associated, of course, that piece with Malcolm. But so my subconscious 
probably projected the image of, of Malcolm, but I also like to think that maybe that was his way of saying goodbye to me. Dr. Robert Shabora had a passion about the life and music of Malcolm Frager. A respected writer and biographer, Dr. Shabora's book, Search and Celebration, The Life and Art of Malcolm Frager, is currently being completed posthumously in conjunction with the documentary, Malcolm Frager, American Pianist. copy of this program, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at prairiepublic.org. Malcolm Frager, American Pianist, is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The friends and family of Dr. Robert Chabora. The Eastman School of Music, Rochester, New York and by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>